Father, we want to thank you today for the privilege to have a part in Brother Paul Johnson's life. Lord, he taught us in his difficulties to make much of Jesus, to use what you gave us. Father, we thank you for his personal testimony of knowing you as Savior. Lord, we know that Brother Paul would have great pleasure if we here today would listen to the gospel that he stood for. Father, comfort this family, comfort friends, help them to look to you. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. On March 17, 2018, Raymond Paul Johnson Jr. gave up his burdensome wheelchair and walked into heavenly home. Paul left behind a wife, Renita Johnson, who longs to hold his hand again, and three children, Johnny Johnson, nine, Carson Johnson, six, and his sweet baby, Coley Johnson, three, who miss her daddy. Paul will also be dearly missed by his mother, Rebecca Johnson, his paternal grandfather, Bill Johnson, his siblings, Joanna Johnson, Amanda Mayhew, April Ryan, and Jonathan Johnson, and a number of nieces and nephews. Paul was preceded in death by his father, Raymond Paul Johnson, Sr., his maternal grandparents, Arthur and Elaine Newton, and his paternal grandmother, Josephine Wicklin. Paul was born on June 19, 1974, in Columbus, Georgia. He grew up in Eufaula, Alabama, where he still has many friends. As a young man, he moved to Milton, Florida, where he lived till his death. He obtained a bachelor's degree from the University of West Florida and Faith Bible College. He then surrendered to God's call to teach and preach God's Word. He ended his ministry as a beloved adult Sunday school teacher at Faith Baptist Church and as a professor of Faith Bible College. At this time, we're going to have Brother Grady Adams come forward and sing.
Johnny and Carson come forward to give us scripture memory. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Boy, they did a good job, didn't they? They did a good job, didn't they? Amen. Folks, this is a home-going celebration. We miss Brother Paul, but we thank the Lord he's walking. Amen. We prayed for him to be healed. He was healed. Not our way, but God's way. Brother Zach Knight, if you would come and give the message, please. Um, my name is Zach Knight. Um, I was a my friend of Brother Paul, and and um, I was one of his uh, students here. He was one of my teachers, and uh, he was uh, he was my best friend. Um, it, it's it's funny too, because it's one of those situations. I'm not sure if I was his best friend, but uh, but he was my best friend, and um, I love him dearly. And I miss him. And uh, <clears throat> he was special. You, you'll never meet anybody. You'll never meet anybody else in this world like Paul Johnson. And um, I, I consider it, um, and if you will, bear with me. I, I'm new to this. Um, I almost kind of think that's why Paul asked me to speak. Um, as one of my teachers, uh, Paul loved pressure. He, he loved to put the pressure on you. And uh, I'd ask him, I'd say, why, why do you make things so tough on us? And uh, he said, pressure is how you make diamonds. And, uh, and then I would always tell him, it's also how you make ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I really do believe that, that that played a major role in why he asked me to speak today. It's, it's one last opportunity for him to teach me something. Um, so anyway, if you will, like I said, new to this so bear with me um, I want to say briefly there's a lot of tears today there have been a lot of tears the past few days been a lot of tears the last few months and, and I want to encourage you don't fight them don't wipe them away let them run their course Amen. let them preach their sermon see those tears those tears are a testimony to just how wonderful a person Paul Johnson is. And uh, embrace them. Enjoy them. Uh, they're special tears. <clears throat> I'd, love to, uh, I'd love to stand here and tell you story after story about Paul sharing his jokes because um, you know jo uh, Paul was a joke teller Paul was a storyteller Paul was the greatest storyteller I've ever met he could talk about anything and it was just fun to be around him and hear him tell a story um, he was something and I'd love to go on and on and on and I could about how wonderful he was about how special he was about how he, 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 he touched my life. He's, he's, my life will never be the same after meeting Paul Johnson. 
And I'd love to go on and on about that, but that's not what Paul wanted. When Paul uh, called me and told me that he'd gotten sick, he, uh, he, he, that very night, he, he told me right then that, that he wanted me to speak. And, and uh, his concern was not himself. Paul wasn't worried about Paul. Paul wasn't worried about where he was going. Paul wasn't worried about the end of all this. But he was worried. He was worried about you. He told me there's going to be a lot of people here who've never trusted Christ as their Savior. Who don't have the blessed hope that Paul had. That, that, that have never found out and understood the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he gave me a charge. He said, preach the gospel. Amen. I got to talk to him four times after he found out he got sick. I got to come down and see him a few times and we talked on the phone a few times. And every single time, he talked about today. We talked about a lot of stuff. We, we, we talked about lots of stuff. He, he cut up, he joke around, because that's just who Paul is. But every single time he mentioned today, Amen. because he loves you people. You obviously love him. That's why you're here today. And uh, I just want to very briefly uh, share a passage of scripture with you. <clears throat> the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Yes, sir. Amen. Verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul Johnson was an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was his uh, representative here on earth, a spokesman for the Lord. And he did his job well. He did his job faithfully. He preached Christ every chance he got. He preached the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a faithful, faithful ambassador of the ministry of reconciliation. Look at, well, if you have your Bibles with you. Verse 19 is that ministry. To wit, that God was in Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He's God Almighty. In human flesh he came to earth the very one that we all have sinned against that we all have wronged that we all have disobeyed and rebelled against that God that God came to earth took on flesh and bone just like us became a man fulfilled the law of God and then bore every sin every transgression, every iniquity, every bad thing you've ever done in your entire life, He made it His. God laid it on His account and judged Him. Judged Him. Judged Him with a judgment that we deserve, that I deserve, that you deserve. Until He was completely satisfied. To wit that God was in Christ. God Almighty became a man. <clears throat> for what purpose? To reconcile us back to Himself. You see, in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the world that separated us from God. There became this barrier, this, this division, this divide that we could not fix. So God Himself came to earth and fixed it. My friends, I'm here to tell you this morning or this afternoon because this is what Paul wants you to know. That divide, that barrier is gone. It's gone. 
He has reconciled the world unto Himself, brought us back to Himself. What was lost in the garden, He regained, He redeemed, He bought it back. He brought it back together. How? Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Not imputing your trespasses unto you. <clears throat> This is what Paul wanted you to hear this, this afternoon. This is what Paul wanted to make sure I told you about. And not just me, but Brother Steve and, and Brother Hively, Brother Joe. He wanted you to know that your sins have not been imputed to you. This is not a future event. This is not something we get him to do one day uh, ahead of us. Or even one day in our lifetime. This happened 2,000 years ago. God took the sins of the world, our sins, He laid them on Christ. Christ took responsibility. Think about that. He took responsibility for our crimes and suffered the rightful judgment of God so that we don't have to. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. John the Baptist said, I left you hanging, didn't I? John the Baptist said in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Yes, My friends, it doesn't happen when you get Him to do it. He did it because He wanted to. He did it because He loves you. He did it because that's who He is. Not because of who you are. Not because of who we are. If it had depended on us, Lord, uh, Lord knows, we'd never make it. But it's because of His love. His great love wherewith He loved us. And the mercy and grace of Almighty God that, that we have reconciliation. At this very moment, at this very moment, I want you to know, Paul wanted you to know, God wants you to know that you sit here forgiven of all your sins. Either He took them away 2,000 years ago or He didn't. My friends, He did. They're gone. It's not something we get Him to do. It's not something we make happen by our good works or our good deeds or, or by even asking Him to do it. He did it because He wanted to. He took the first step. We, we, didn't, we didn't prompt Him to do that. He did it because that's who He is. Not imputing our trespasses unto us. I cannot stress that enough. As you sit here this morning, your sins do not exist. Your sins, if, if they're weighing on your conscience, if they're eating you up, and beating you down, I tell you, it is only in your mind. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, that's what Christ did for all mankind, not just believers, but for all mankind. He made peace through the blood of His cross. Yeah. By Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works... In your mind, the Bible says. In your mind, God says. Yet now, now hath He reconciled. My friends, I'm here to tell you, and I cannot, I cannot, I cannot stress it enough. You sit here this morning without a sin problem. They've been put away by the Lamb of God. And you know what He wants you to do? Believe it. He wants you to take Him at His word. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to let go of self. He wants you to forsake your own self-righteousness, your good deeds, your good intentions, your sinner's prayer, your church membership, whatever it may be. He says, let go and just trust me. Trust me, you want to know why that's so hard to believe? You know why it takes us years and years and years to come to that understanding? Because it's hard to imagine that a God 
who knows me better than me could love me that much, could love you that much. My friends, I, I'm here to tell you, he didn't die for the cleaned up version of you. He didn't, buy, he didn't die for the, for the suit wearing, church going, Bible reading version of you. He died for the worst version of you. He died for that version of you that nobody else in here knows. He died for that version of you that you don't want to look in the mirror. That's who he died for. He didn't die for you at your best. He died for you at your very, very worst. That's love. That's a love that I don't think this side of eternity will ever understand. We just get a, a glimpse of it. My friends, this is what Paul wanted you to hear this afternoon. He wanted you to know that your sin problem has already been taken care of. You know how a man can, can lie on his deathbed waiting, waiting to go and worry about other people? It's because of this right here. It's because he knew that his sin problem was fixed. He knew that he had been counted righteous in the eyes of a holy God. He knew that he had a home in heaven. Waiting for Him. You can have that too. You can have that peace that passeth all understanding. You can have that comfort and assurance that never goes away, that never fades away. But you have to get it the same way Paul did. You have to get into this book. You have to find out what Christ has done for you. You have to see that He's absolutely satisfied the just demands of a holy God. He came to earth. He lived a perfect 33 years fulfilling the law, never breaking one rule, satisfying what God wanted. Satisfying. Perfectly. God's law. And then at the end of it all, He died with the sins of those who could not. That's you and me. That's us. That's the whole world. My friends, we, we say it all the time and, 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 and it's scriptural to say that. It's scriptural to say that Jesus died for our sins. That's a scriptural statement. But I, I feel like as we preach it and as we hear it and, and as it goes forth somewhere between our ear and our brain, it gets twisted around and we think, oh, that means I have the potential to be forgiven. That's not right. My friends, you don't have the potential to be forgiven. You are forgiven right now. He did not just die for your sins. He died with your sins. He died with every sin you'll ever commit. He took it into the grave and He left them there. He destroyed sin. He destroyed the works of Satan. And one day, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. <clears throat> I want to read you a couple more verses. And, and I'm going to... I have a tendency to be long-winded. And I'm trying not to do that. Which, by the way, is the first thing, the very first thing Paul ever taught me not to be. <laughs> It, it, we, we uh, in homiletics class where, where they basically teach you how to preach or how to develop sermons and outlines and things like that before we got into any of that stuff the first thing Paul taught us was stay within your time and I have failed him miserably <laughs> the Bible says in Revelation 21 4 it says and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away and he that sat upon the throne said behold I make all things new and he said unto me right for these words are true and faithful you see when all the the dust down here and in heaven when everything when all the when the dust settles 
and everything wraps up and all is said and done, there'll be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. But right before that, right before that, you know what's going to happen. God's going to have to wipe away some tears. You know what those tears will be for? You see, Paul's pain, the burden of this earthly body, Paul's done with all that. It's over. But there's one thing left for him. A few more tears. People say, there's going to be no crying in heaven. Well, how's God going to wipe away these tears? There's going to be crying. You want to know why? Because when everything wraps up, when everything settles down, for those of us that are there, for those of you that are there, we're going to look around and we're going to be missing some people. Paul's going to look around and some of you won't be there. Don't do it. Don't put this off. Get into the Word of God like Paul did. Find out who Christ is. Find out what He did for you. Find out how sufficient, just how perfectly sufficient His work was and just how satisfied, how completely satisfied God is with that work. And trust Him. Amen. Trust Him. Amen. My friends, 2,000 years ago, He took the sin of the world, our sin, He laid it on Christ and He judged Christ to use Paul's words until he was satisfied with us. Until he was satisfied with us. You see, he, there was never a time when he wasn't satisfied with Christ. He judged Christ until he was satisfied with us. Amen. And now because of that, because of the precious blood of Christ that satisfied the wrath of God for all time, for all sin, for all people, he looks at us. All we have to do is believe. That's it, Brother Bill. Just believe it. Just trust Him. His message, because of that today to you, as you sit here, as you are right now, is come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My friends, He didn't die for you after you straightened up. He didn't start loving you when you changed who you are or when you started to be faithful to church, or when you started reading your Bible, or when you, you prayed a prayer. He didn't start loving you then. The Bible tells us that he, we love Him because He first loved us. He loved you before any of that. He died for you before any of that. He died for you. He paid your sin debt. He put away your sins before you even knew what sin was. And all He wants you to do is believe it. I, I leave you with this. I feel like I've been up here too long. Are you going to rest? Are you going to rest in the finished work of Christ? Are you going to let go of self-righteousness, of, of, of deeds, of, of the things you've done, whatever it may be, of the prayer you pray? Are you going to let go and rest in the finished work of Christ? Or are you going to be one of the ones that breaks Paul's heart? That breaks my heart? That breaks the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you more than Paul? My friends, search the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures. Find out who Christ is. Understand what He did for you. Lord, say, show me. Lord, show me. And He'll do just that. He'll do just that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for loving us and dying for us. I thank You for Your mercy and grace. Lord, I thank You for Your blood that washed away our sins. Lord, I thank You for Christ who bore our sins in His own body on the tree and put them away, Lord, by the sacrifice of Himself. Lord, I thank You that because of that tree, these bitter waters that we come upon in this life
can be made sweet. Lord, I thank you for Paul. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the privilege it was just to, just to know him, just to be his friend. Lord, I pray. I pray you bless his family, his friends, all these that have come out today. I pray you'd comfort them the way that only you can. And Lord, I pray if there's one who hasn't trusted you as Savior, Lord, they'd get into your word, find out what you've done, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, so that we can all one day, I pray everyone in this room, one day, Lord, we're, reu we, we're reunited Amen. with Paul. Thank you, Lord, for Christ. Amen. Thank you. Amen. At this time, we're going to have everyone stand. Miss Tammy Smallwood, if you'll come forward. You may be seated. Do you need that in the pulpit? Do you need this or the pulpit? You're going to use the pulpit? No, you don't. Okay. There you go. And when he takes me by the hand 
and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Thank you, Miss Tammy. That will be a glorious day, won't it? Like what Brother Zach said, though, are you ready? We sure don't want to leave you behind. We want you to go with us. This time, we're going to have Brother Steve Doss come and bring us the final message. <clears throat> well, I want to thank you all for coming today. On behalf of the family, thank you. Um, I met the Johnsons and well, I went by five, so I don't really remember meeting them, but uh, 1975, I think Paul was about a year old, Miss Becky. And uh, <clears throat> Paul, well, let's not sugarcoat it, he was a rascal. And uh, I told somebody the other day, God knew what he was doing, Miss Becky, when he put him in a wheelchair. Don't you take that the wrong way. Uh, you know, Paul, Paul didn't always, he hadn't had the easiest time always. He had a lot of surgeries. I've seen him in a lot of uh, cast up to his waist. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot, when people found out he had cancer, they said, man, why? He's had it so rough all his life. Well, don't you feel sorry for Paul Johnson? Paul Johnson might have missed out on a few things here in life as far, as far as sports goes and things like that. But Paul Johnson got something right that many people don't get right. Amen. If you're not careful, you won't get it right. And I say you won't get it right. You won't find out who Jesus is. You know, growing up, he did. He, he had a little bit of a rough time and uh, those Mills boys and my brothers, we always had a good time with Paul. I always admired the way Miss Becky took care of him. You got Joanna and Amanda and April and Jonathan. And then came a time where they moved to Milton, Florida. And then he met the love of his life, Miss Renita. And you was the love of his life. Uh... You know, Paul's greatest concern, I, I got to have a lot of conversations with Paul. He loved his family. He loved his brother and his sister. One of his main concerns was that some of you was going to be angry with God when all this was over with. You know what he used to tell me when I'd go see him? He said, Steve, God makes no mistakes. And he don't. We don't ever understand some of his ways and why. And why he does certain things. But one day we'll understand it. Amen. But don't feel sorry for Paul. His, his greatest concern for his children was that they'd find out who Jesus is through reading and studying the Word of God. And Jonathan, Johnny, you're the oldest out of this crew. So in your daddy's main concern wasn't that you make plenty of money or be the most popular person in Milton, Florida or to be a great football star, a baseball star. His greatest concern for you is for you to find out who Jesus is and make yourself available for him. <clears throat> That's what your dad done. Your dad was a man of God. He wasn't perfect, but he was a man of God and he served him. He allowed himself to be used. Amen. You know, probably one of the funniest memories I have of Paul is him, you know, we was in school together and I don't know how old Paul was, but 
he, you know, he was in that wheelchair and Lord, the boy got in more trouble than people with two good feet. <laughs> Didn't he, Miss Becky? He went out there, he got a valve stem remover out of the shop, went out there and let the, let the, took the valve stems out of this teacher's, this teacher's car and set her car down on the rims, all four of them. And you say, Steve, did you think that was funny? No, I didn't. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> he, he couldn't have done it to a better person. Paul really could. He, he could get in a lot of trouble. Uh, he, he's definitely one of a kind. And, you know, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul quoted this verse to me and he quoted it to Renita. It's a verse he wanted us all to remember. He said, I, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. He says, concerning them which are asleep. You know, his old body went to sleep. It was tired. God's going to resurrect that body one day. Is asleep. See, you know the day you feel here and you feel hopeless. Listen, the Bible says that there weren't, were, he says there's nothing wrong with the mourning and sorrow and that's why he gave us tears. So you cry. But he says we're not supposed to mourn as others do. You know why? Because we know for a fact that we're going to get to see Paul again because Paul's in heaven and dear friend, if you'll trust Christ, it's a guarantee. That's where our hope lies and that's what will get you through these days. He says, which are asleep, he says, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. I hope you're here today and you, you, I have an expectation of seeing Paul Johnson again one day. And I can promise you this, heaven's not the same since he got there. Less than it can't be. I don't know if he's joined heaven's choir, but if he has, he's doing cartwheels between the verses. He's doing something. He heaven's not the same. Paul, Paul, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't have to worry about Paul. Don't feel sorry for Paul. What Paul wants today is for you to, to search the scriptures and make sure that you know where you're going. Dear friend, there's not very many people that know for a fact that if they took their last breath, where they would go. I seen Paul uh, Tuesday a week ago and he couldn't talk much. Mr. Renee, I appreciate the way you took care of him. You don't have no regrets. I still can't believe he's gone. I looked at him, I said, Paul, are you afraid? He looked at me and said, not a bit. He said, not a bit, but his concern was for his family. And I know this is dragging out a little bit. And, uh, Hebrews chapter 13, when Paul told me that, Paul was one of the most intelligent people that I knew. Uh, he's a lot smarter than I am. Uh, he... Uh, he knew how to tell a joke, and Zach said he could tell a man, he could tell a story. They got better. If you could, you, listen, you could hear the same story, and it just got better every time he told it. <laughs> but when he told me, he says, Steve, I'm not, he says, I'm not afraid a bit. I thought about Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. In, in Malachi chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6, he says, Jesus Christ... Uh, uh, I am the Lord, I change not. That's right. I am the Lord, I change not. You see, uh, Paul had a, a no-so salvation. It wasn't a hope-so, it wasn't a maybe-so, and it wasn't I feel like it. You know why? Because cause, cause he dealt with facts. Yeah. Amen. Fa he fa listen, he dealt with the authority. Amen. And that's why he could lay there and take his last breath and not fear what comes next. Yeah. You know why? Because he already knew. He already knew. There's not too many people that know that, dear friend. Uh, but James 1.17 is a good verse. He says there's no variableness in him. Listen, friend, he changes not. 
He, he's, he was the same before he ever created the world. And when he destroys this old earth, he's still going to be the same God. You know, today we have houses of religion. There's more churches on, on every corner and there's fewer people that know that they're saved today than ever before. And that's exactly why Paul wanted us to preach the gospel for a few minutes. Do you know, dear friend, in Hebrews chapter 15, see, dear friend, there's only one gospel. And, and what we've done today is we've perverted the gospel. What we've done is we've made the gospel fit what we want it to be. See, we, we've got people coming down to the thousands and asking Jesus to come in their heart or inviting Jesus into their life. You know you can't find that in the Bible. It's not in there. If, it, if you can find it, bring it and show it to me because I want to see it. You know, the Bible says, and in, in, in I'm trying to hurry, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 8, the Bible says that Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. He says in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 4, write them down. You know what he says? Abraham called upon the name of the Lord. But you know what happened in Genesis chapter 15? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 15, and he believed in the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. See, see Abraham didn't call upon the Lord for, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ the righteousness to be imputed to him. He didn't call upon the Lord for him to be placed into Christ. You know what he done? He found out who God was and he believed in him. He believed the word of God. And today, dear friend, you have churches. The last verse on their, their tracks is Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And dear friend, you are not rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not Bible salvation. The Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in Genesis chapter 15, what we have is Abraham took God at his word and it was imputed. The Lord Jesus Christ, his righteousness was imputed to him. He was placed into Christ and he was welcome to go to heaven. You know how you get saved today? The very exact same way. You know, John chapter 3 and verse 16 is probably the, the, the most quoted verse. The, the pe children learn it. They used to learn it when they were young. I don't even think uh, parents teach it to their children anymore. Used to, if you was a kid, uh, you learned John 3.16. Right. But there's not very many people that really know what John 3.16 says. You know, everybody wants salvation. To, to, they they want to be baptized for salvation. They want to be slain in the spirit for salvation. They want to speak in tongues for salvation. They want to come down here and ask God to do something that he's already done for salvation. Amen. God didn't tell you to come in and ask for forgiveness of sins to go to heaven. You'll not find it in the scripture, dear friend. You know why? Because all of your sins, not according to cause of what I say, but because of what this says, right? All of our sins was laid on the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And when you come down here and ask him to forgive you for your sins to go to heaven, you don't believe that he took care of them 2,000 years ago. That's Bible salvation, dear friend. You know, in John chapter, he, he tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He didn't start loving you when you cleaned up. You look at the woman at the well, dear friend. He didn't try to make an honest woman out of her. The woman taken in adultery. You know what he said? Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Look at the thief on the cross. Dear friend, if he had had to clean up to go to heaven, he was nailed down to a cross. You, you know what he'd done to go to heaven? He believed God. He believed God. Man wants to do everything but take God at his word. Man wants to go to heaven uh, leaning on their own understanding instead of what the scripture says. He says Who, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. You notice he says, but have everlasting life. Dear friend, it's, a, it's everlasting life. If he hadn't meant everlasting life, he wouldn't have put it in there. You know, he'd have to put part-time life or till you mess it up again. See, it's not dependent upon your performance. That's why it's such a great salvation. That's why he asked the question, how shall you escape if you, next so, if you, if you neglect so great a salvation? Come on, brother. That's why he asked that question, dear friend. 
You know, in John chapter 3 and verse 36, he says, He that believeth on the Son. He don't tell you to ask. That's right, Brother Bill. He, he says, believe. Take me at my word. But dear friend, there's very few people that you won't take the time to find out who he is. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy illustration, but if I go into the Atlanta airport, where's my baby at, my grandbaby? Is she in here? They had to take her out. If I, if I go into a, to a store, and this is a crazy illustration, and I have to go to the bathroom, and I need somebody to hold that baby, I cannot walk up to a stranger and say, hey, you take my baby, i got to run to the restroom. You can't do that. Why can't I do that? Because you don't know them. You don't know them. You can't trust them. And if I run into Jonathan, I can hand my grandbaby to Jonathan and know that he'll give his life to protect my grandbaby and come back and he's still going to have my grandbaby. You know why? Because I know him. You say, Steve, the Lord seems so far away and I just, it just, he just don't seem trustworthy because you don't know him. It's because you don't know him. Listen, dear friend, there's never, ever been anybody saved that trusted Christ that weren't persuaded. See, we either believe in good works and see the only, the only thing that can remove the fact that you have to do good works to go to heaven is this. There's, there's people right here in this room that's been taught that they have to ask Jesus to come into their life. They have to ask for forgiveness. They have to go through this ritual before they can be saved. And you know what God has to do? He has to persuade you that that's not true. He has to persuade you that baptism absolutely has nothing to do with you going to heaven. He has to persuade you that just because you don't feel like you're going to heaven, that, you're, that listen, feelings don't have anything to do with salvation. It's, it's, it's what his word says. He says, he that, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, real quickly, in John chapter 6, I'm not going to keep you very, just a few minutes. John chapter 6, in verse 27, he says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth. This is when they crossed over. They was looking for him the next day unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. And they ask him a question in John chapter 6, in verse 28. They said, then, said, then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? They looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, what is it? What is it that I can do that's going to please God? You know what, you know what Jesus told them? Go get baptized. No, that's not what he told them. He didn't tell them to say a nice little prayer. You know what he said? Look, look at it in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's the only thing that works. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same way Abraham got saved. And dear friend, if we're going to go to heaven, it's the way we're going to get saved. There's not another way. There's not another way. You know, look in John chapter 9. These are real close. So it won't take us long to turn over to them. John chapter 9, he had, he had, uh, Jesus had healed a blind man. And after they had kicked him out of the synagogue in John chapter 9, Jesus found him. The Bible says in John 9, 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, listen to what Jesus asked him. Jesus didn't ask him if he belonged to a church. Jesus didn't ask him if he had went through man's ritual and said their little prayer. You know what he asked him? He says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Dost thou believe? That's, that's what he asked him. Jesus himself was giving out the gospel, and that was the gospel. Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And you say, Well, Steve, what do I believe? Well, I'm glad you asked me that because I want to show it to you real quick. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. You know, I, I, I speak at, at, at some uh, quite a bit of funerals, and funerals are the toughest place to, to give the gospel out because uh, you get some of the nastiest looks at funerals. People think you don't want to go in there and struck everybody on the head and tell them everybody's going to heaven, everything's fine, and we go home. And it's not, that's not the way it is. Right. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place 
having obtained eternal redemption for us. Do you know, dear friend, today salvation is a work that's already taken place. You know why people are still coming down to the altar and asking Jesus to forgive them for their sin and come into their life and to save them? Because they don't, either they don't know or they don't want to know. Yeah. Sal listen, salvation is not what you get God to do for you. Salvation is what he has already done. And you know what he says? Believe me. And I'm going to go ahead and say it because this is Paul's, Paul's service. There are some of you today that believe that you're going to heaven because you've asked Jesus in your heart. And I can tell you this. When you lay down at night, you don't know for a fact that you're saved. You don't know that. You hope you are. Hebrews 9, 12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves. And look what he says. He's referring back to the, to the sacrifices. He says, But by his own blood, dear friend, he didn't enter into the holy place with somebody else's blood. He, it's a personal thing. He entered in with his own blood. And do you know that that satisfied God? Amen. That blood is on the mercy seat. Listen, you know what God told him that day? He told me this last night. I'm just kidding, he didn't. He looked at Jesus and he says, you know what? He says, that's the last blood I'll ever need. Amen. You know why? Because he is the lamb. Amen. He wasn't a lamb. He's the lamb. He said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, dear friend, either you believe he took your sin away or you don't. And the reason we're up in pulpits today across America trying to get people to do something for their salvation is because we don't believe it. He says, neither by the blood of goats and the calves, but by his own blood he entered. It's already done. It's something he's already done. He entered in once. He's not going to enter in again. He entered in once into the holy place, and the Bible says, having obtained, past tense, eternal redemption for us. Amen. Do you know today that the wickedest person that's living today on earth, if they drop dead in the next 10 minutes, they will not go to hell because of their sin? You said, Steve, why do you say that? Because their sin has already been paid for. Amen. It's already been paid for. Amen. It didn't have anything to do with them asking them to pay for them. The Bible, you said, well, Steve, you see that verse in Romans 10, 9, where if, if you confess uh, thy, uh, with thy mouth, the Bible, the Bible also says, believe in thine heart. Dear friend, if you don't believe in your heart, you don't have anything to confess. Right. I hope you understand that. So what we're doing today is we're getting people to, to say some words and then we're telling them they're saved. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, But this man, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. The work's been done, dear friend. There's nothing else to be done as far as salvation goes. The Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, there's plenty of verses in here that, that show us that it's finished. You say, well, Steve, what I believe? You believe the Word of God. You don't, you don't even believe me. You, you believe that when he said it is finished in John 19, 30, that's exactly what he said. Quit, quit listen, quit coming down here trying to get him to finish it. Quit, quit, quit going down here trying to do good works, trying to get him to finish it. He's screaming from the throne, I've finished it. I believe that's what Paul would want you to know today. I, that, that's, that's what he asked us. To, to, to preach John chapter 3 and I'm, I'm going to close John chapter 3 in verse 18 the word of God says and by the way dear friend this asking Jesus in your heart and asking him into your life is nothing but Satan that's all it is it's a ritual, and, 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 and listen, it's sending more people to hell than all the other denominations put together. John chapter 3 and verse 18. Listen to John 3, 18. He says, he that believeth on him. See, it's, it's, it's a decision you're going to make. So if you're here today and you think you're going to heaven because you've asked Jesus in your heart, you're, you're limited to what you can read in this right here. 
You understand why I'm telling you? You know why you're limited to what you can read in this record? Because it'll put you under conviction. The Bible says, he that believeth on him. Our salvation is in a person. Right now, Paul is in heaven worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's seated at the right hand of the throne. And I can only imagine what Paul's doing. He says, he that believeth on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, is not condemned. See, if he had told one, Brother Kenny, if he had wanted you to, to say a prayer. Do you know how many times I said a prayer growing up trying to get saved? Huh? Go ahead, brother. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't. I, I looked through the cards the other day at the church. In one year, I went forward. And listen, I was sincere. I cried. I blowed snot. I didn't want to go to hell. But you know what? I didn't know I was saved. You know when I found out I was saved? When I got in the Word of God for myself and I found out how much God loved me and found out that He died for me 2,000 years ago, not when I was pleasing to Him. And you know what I found out? I found out that I was welcome to go to heaven. Amen. Taking him at his word. John 3, 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Dear friend, God did not deal with your sins when you were pleasing to him. God did not deal with your sins when you came down here and asked him to. God did not deal with your sins when you got sincere and started going to church and quit drinking, smoking, and cussing. God dealt with your sins 2,000 years ago. You know what he's saying today? Please believe me. Please believe me. Quit trying to get me to do something that I've already done for you. Thank you, and I appreciate you coming. Brother Joe Sollers is going to come right now. All right. Um, Brother Joe Sollers will be preaching the graveside. Um, it's at Serenity Gardens, those of you that will be going. But uh, we want Brother Lunsford to come forward for the closing prayer. Brother Lunsford was there the day that Brother Paul got saved. And so we'd like Brother Lunsford to go ahead and close in prayer. Paul Johnson was my friend. He was my spiritual son. These men have done what Paul wanted done. Challenged you about where you're going to spend eternity. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that you've called your servant home, Paul Johnson. And we take comfort in your word and the testimony that Paul has left behind. We know that it was Paul's desire and prayer that his death be used to influence family and friends to receive you as Savior. Lord, we will leave the results to you. We ask it in that name above all names, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes the service at the director, funeral director will take charge.